CS eTalk series on quantum science challenges and opportunities presented by Philippe Boyer. So I'm going to give everybody another minute and then we'll get started with some general information that I'll read off to you and then I'll introduce Philippe for you. Thank you. Heather with AVS, and we are ready to start the AVS eTalk series on quantum science challenges and opportunities presented by Philip Boyer. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to this talk. This is our first one. Uh, please place your phones on mute, and note we will also have all attendees muted as well. Upon registering, you are able to submit a question to be answered by Philip Boyer. These questions will be reviewed by him, and he will do his best to answer as many as possible. During the end of the session, at the last uh, when he closes out, this is a one-hour presentation with no scheduled breaks. Uh, we look forward to you enjoying the talk, and we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, so, AVS has some upcoming events we'd like to make you aware of. We have uh, another uh, AVS webinar coming up on phase change memory technology. This is coming up later this month, and there is still time to register. <coughs> this is being presented by Eric Joseph and Yu Zhu. Uh, we also have a few AVS short course programs coming up this fall. Uh, registration is open for both of them right now. We have the AVS Southern California chapter at the end of this month, and the AVS 66 National Short Course Program that's taking place with our International Symposium and Exhibition at the end of October. We also have a couple of other technical meetings on the forefront with our annual symposium in Columbus, Ohio at the end of October, uh, PCSI 47 in Boulder, Colorado in January, and ICMCTF in um, San Diego in April and May of 2020. Um, right now I'd like to introduce the upcoming eTalk. Uh, Philip Boyer is our Editor-in-Chief of the AVS Quantum Science Journal, it's a new journal, and a collaborative effort between AIP Publishing and AVS Quantum Science. So with that said, I'd like to introduce Philip Boyer, and we welcome you to the AVS eTalk. Thank you. Well, thank you, Heather, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, connecting to this uh, e-talk, uh, which is also my first e-talk. Uh, in the next hour and in these next 45 minutes, I will uh, first try to give you an introduction on quantum science uh, uh, and then focus on some of the science I've been uh, basically working on in the uh, during my career, uh, also on quantum science and also with emphasis on quantum technology and the new uh, development for quantum technologies. Uh, so when what is what is quantum science? Uh, maybe lots of you know. So it's, it's it's one of the major theory nowadays, and it was introduced about a century ago. And uh, the first thing when you uh, think about quantum is the idea of quantization. And one of the first ideas of quantum science was indeed to quantize energy or uh, to quantize basically the, the description of nature. And you have a small cartoon on this slide which uh, gives a, like a picture of this quantization. If you imagine, for example, a, a bucket of water, if you shake the bucket, so you put energy in the bucket, you, you will have some, some, some waves. Uh, the more you shake the bucket, the more waves you can have. Uh, and what quantum mechanics will tell you is basically each of these excitations is quantized. So even if you put lots of energy, you need to reach a certain threshold uh, to see more excitation on the bucket. And that 
uh, one of the first very important findings, uh, for instance, introduced by Max Planck, that you will have to quantize energy uh, with uh, a multiple of an elementary unique, which is related to the Planck constant. Uh, of course, if you start to quantize energy, uh, you can think of light. Uh, we all know that light is actually uh, some, some uh, radiation, electromagnetic field. It carries energy, and if you quantize energy, yet you can think that you will also quantize light and quantize the electromagnetic field. And that led to uh, also very, uh, very soon in the development of quantum mechanics to the introduction of the quantum of light by Albert Einstein in 2005. Uh, that was basically one of the key to explain uh, the photoelectric effect that led to the Nobel Prize. Uh, and this quantization of light later was introduced as a particle of light, what we call photon, it comes from the Greek, and it was introduced about 20 years after Einstein uh, defined that light was quantized. And nowadays we uh, speak about optics or photonics as a reference of this particle of light, which are photons. Uh, so having quantized energy or quantized fields allowed a very important development for, for, for quantum science as well. And it's the, uh, the definition of atomic physics. Uh, now you can uh, try to understand how atoms are uh, assembled. Uh, of course, you have a nuclei, and then you have an electron. And the first definition before, quanta, uh, bef before quantum mechanics introduced an electron as a mechanical uh, object rotating around the nuclei. But soon, quantum mechanics and Niels Bohr, who had first a Bohr model which was classical, introduced this definition that you can think of an atom as a uh, nuclei with electron who will actually feel some quantized level uh, or quantize orbits around this nuclei. And the more you, the higher you go in this quantized level of uh, the electron, the, the higher you go in uh, the classification of atoms, and that was a way uh, to introduce uh, the, uh, the, the table uh, for all the atoms. And that has already some very important uh, applications, this uh, quantization and this definition of the atom. Uh, for instance, that led to spectroscopy. So if you send light with a very precise energy, uh, and if this energy corresponds to uh, the energy of one of this uh, electronic level of an atom, then light can be basically absorbed by the atoms. And uh, this uh, allows you, for instance, to, uh, by looking at the different absorption lines, define which atom is there. And this is something which is used already uh, still today, it's very important, for, in, for instance, for uh, doing some spectroscopic analysis of the air, for looking at uh, uh, pollution in the air, etc. Uh, of course, if you think of this application of spectroscopy, uh, there is another big consequence, which was a, a revolution of the, the middle of the last century, uh, a consequence of quantum mechanics, which first basically was extremely important for this uh, techniques of spectroscopy, it's the laser. And the laser is also a consequence, a direct consequence of the quantization of the energy level of the atom and the quantization as well of the, the electromagnetic field, the light. Uh, the idea here is if, as I said before, you send some light uh, at uh, an energy which corresponds to the difference between two quantized levels of the atoms, the light will be absorbed by the atom, and the uh, electron will actually go from one level to a more excited level, as you could see on the small cartoon here. But now, the electron at this uh, very high level is, cannot stay very long, and then the electron will go back to its, what we say, ground state, or the state of lowest energy, and it will release back the energy in the form of a, a photon, in the form of the light. If now you have an ensemble of, of atoms, all together, they can actually absorb and remit this light in a way which will build up more and more photons with the same characteristic, the same color, and uh, the same direction. And that's what we call 
stimulated emission of light. Basically, each atom stimulates the other, and that's a uh, uh, quantum effect, uh, really coming from quantum mechanics. And this stimulated emission amplifies the light and can make very uh, powerful, very intense uh, beams of light with many, many photons that were all emitted together, stimulated by uh, this assembly of atoms, as you can see on this picture. And the laser is a, a very big uh, revolution uh, in our technology today uh, as a consequence of quantum mechanics. Uh, it's the first use of this laser was really for science and spectroscopy. And then, of course, you all know the, 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 the CDs uh, and the Blu-rays that are using uh, light that are laser or a version which is not as intense of the laser, but which is called the, the, the LEDs. And, of course, you have also now applications in, uh, in measuring distances with laser. Uh, this, techniques is, this technology is, for instance, used in, uh, in uh, cars for autonomous driving and etc. But the story of quantum mechanics does not stop to uh, uh, the laser and does not stop to this quantization of energy. Once uh, introduced this idea that uh, you can quantize energy, you can quantize fields, you can quantize light, and you have particles, uh, immediately appeared another uh, very important consequence of uh, quantum mechanics uh, or quantum physics is the fact that quantum physics is not deterministic, we say it's probabilistic. There is no, you cannot define with an absolute precision a state, the energy of a state, the position of a state, and this uh, is uh, characterized by this famous equation, which is on this slide, uh, which is called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which, for instance, states that if you are trying to look at an object, like a photon, you cannot with absolute certainty, find its position and also know its momentum or its velocity. There is a, a minimum uncertainty between them. And the better you will define its position, the worse you will be in knowing at which speed it's uh, moving or reciprocally, if you can actually cool it down and, and freeze your particle, then you will have a large Earth's uncertainty on, on its position. And this uh, probability as a a direct consequence is if you actually want to measure a, sy a system, a quantum system, you cannot determine exactly what will be the result. And one of these uh, famous uh, Gedanken experiment or this, uh, the famous concept, uh, consequence of these uh, ideas about quantum measurement is the, the Schrodinger cat, uh, which uh, Schrodinger introduced to show how conceptually difficult it is to uh, actually understand uh, this idea that quantum mechanics is probabilistic. The Schrodinger cat, just uh, briefly, this experiment, you can you put a cat in a box, uh, but you put a cat in a box with a radioactive uh, sample, which uh, can actually uh, be uh, emit one particle that uh, will uh, eventually kill the cat or not. You close the box. When you close the box, you know that the cat is, uh, uh, is still alive, but you let, leave, let the cat in the box long enough so that this uh, radioactive emission can actually emit one of these death ray, and but you don't know when. And then the cat is in a situation where either there was this emission and it's, it's dead, or it's not dead because the emission did not happen. This uh, tells you that as long as you do not actually perform a measurement, you don't know what is the state of your system. And this uh, is characterized in the small cartoon, if I go back to it, where uh, you can see that here in the small cartoon, when, you, uh, when the eye closes, you still are in the superposition of two electronic states, a, a, a low one and a high one. And only when you look at it, then there is a, a choice which is made uh, whether you see it uh, in the lower state, lower energy state, one state, or in the higher energy state, the, 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 the excited state. And this uh, has raised lots of questions and uh, lots of 
controversy uh, about whether this idea of uh, uh, probabilistic uh, measurement was real or not. Uh, one of the uh, yeah, so this is uh, the, this this idea that you the cat is dead or alive uh, until you actually make a measurement and you can only measure one of the two situations, of course, but until you measure it, there is no uh, uh, there is no uh, choice made and the the system is what we call in a coherent superposition a superposition of two states that can be uh, contradictory. This uh, idea that you can have a state which uh, has two different status which are contradictory uh, can come back now to this uh, fact that uh, I introduced at the beginning that you can quantize, for, for instance, light. And you can quantize light so that light can be described as a, by a photon, but you can also not quantize light. And then you can describe light as it was done until the introduction of quantum mechanics as an electromagnetic field. And this uh, led to another revolutionary finding of uh, quantum mechanics, which is the duality between two uh, descriptions. And uh, here we speak about a description, which is the, the classical description of a field, either an electromagnetic field, uh, and usually, if you want to describe a field, you will describe it as a radiation, uh, like a wave, and the wave is described by a frequency, which is at which, which is the periodicity in time of the oscillation of this wave, or a wavelength, which is the periodicity in space uh, of this wave. But now, on the other side, you have the particles. Uh, we know that we are made of uh, material particles like atoms, and it will be described by an energy. It can correspond to it, the kinetic energy, for instance, and a momentum, which relates to uh, the velocity multiplied by the mass of the particle. Uh, but even if the photon has no mass, it has actually, it carries momentum. And what quantum mechanics tells you is if you uh, actually cannot really decide uh, until you make a measurement between two different states, then you can have a duality between a description of your system as a wave and a description of your system as a particle. And one of the uh, famous experiments that has been done with many type of uh, system in the, in the classical and the quantum regimes is uh, what we call the uh, young fringes two slit experiment. So it's, a, it's an experiment where you uh, uh, send some uh, radiation, for instance. As if we start with light, you send, you, you send some light through two slits. And if your light is done by a laser or is uh, coherent, so if you can see interference, then after sending the light, as you see on this picture now, you will see a pattern on the screen which will be periodic and correspond to constructive or destructive interference, corresponds to uh, uh, places where the radiation coming from the two slits is actually in phase. In this case, you have constructive interference or out of phase. Now, if you were doing the same experiment with a classical description of particles, you would just have a probability for the atoms to go through one slit or the other and eventually to bounce on the border of that and just see either two very nice spots corresponding to a uh, the, the, the classical trajectory through the slits or a random distribution as shown here, corresponding to the fact that uh, your particles are coming from anywhere. And actually, if you do the experiment with light and you start to uh, reduce the intensity, to turn down the intensity of your light at a level where only one photon will come at a time and you can actually have a detector, it's, it's a experiment uh, in which each uh, time a photon comes, you have like one uh, spot. Then you will see, as uh, what happened on the small movie, that you you will still have the spot as if you were sending some classical particles. But after many, many spots, after repeating the experiments, you will start to see exactly the same pattern as if you were actually having waves. And that's an experiment which is a proof of the uh, wave particle duality and the fact that in between the time where 
the light, the radiation was emitted the time you detect, you cannot really make a choice between whether you should describe the evolution as a wave, which uh, is uh, right in this case, or as a particle. And that raised, again, lots of controversy because conceptually uh, sounds very odd to uh, have something which is uh, on one hand very fuzzy and on the other hand very well defined, or on one hand a wave and on the other hand a, a classical particle. And I come back on that uh, later with some experiments, uh, more recent experiments using atoms, and we'll see that we can now more or less engineer and, and make experiments that show this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, somewhat odd behavior. So that's uh, about it for this uh, very uh, very brief introduction or very fast introduction of quantum mechanics, just to get some some concepts about it. And I just want to uh, introduce that even if we stop at that stage, which is basically the the, uh, the, the first revolution of quantum mechanics that we usually quote, uh, in which we had the quantization of the energy, the definition of the atom, the introduction of the fact that light can be quantized, that we uh, can do spectroscopy and we can do some excitation, that already led to uh, most of the uh, major technologies that we are using today. Uh, if you think about, uh, so I already mentioned lasers and, and LEDs, uh, uh, light emitting diodes. Uh, LEDs, you find it everywhere, in your house, in your car. Uh, they, uh, they were engineered because we can understand how this, the, the material which we built these uh, LEDs with uh, work in the quantum regime, how the electrons in this material behave and etc. We need quantum mechanics to understand how it works. Um, for the laser, you need quantum mechanics to understand how the light is amplified. But you have many other things like the photo detectors, all the CCD that you're using on your iPhone in your camera, you need quantum mechanics. It's actually uh, uh, some kind of direct consequence of the photoelectric effect uh, that uh, was actually that triggered quantum mechanics at the beginning. And of course, uh, when you start to miniaturize uh, components, you need the quantum mechanics to understand the behavior of, for instance, the electron as a conductor in those components, and that's exactly what you need to understand and to engineer transistors, processors, microprocessors, and so the current computers, the one we are using today, need quantum mechanics to a certain level in order to understand and to engineer what is the key, the, the, the core of this uh, the computer, which is the, the, the microprocessor. And there are many other things. Uh, the uh, the reson uh, magnetic resonance imaging, which is a tool for medicine, is you need quantum mechanics to understand that, etc., etc. So quantum mechanics is everywhere. Uh, there is not a single piece of technology that you're using today in which quantum mechanics did not have an impact. So it's just to uh, realize that this uh, uh, this theory, this uh, theoretical concept, science that uh, actually was born a century ago, already after like 40 or 50 years, had a huge impact on the society. But the story does not stop here. And we, uh, most of scientists, and uh, even more than that, believe that today we uh, are at the uh, edge of a, a second quantum revolution. Uh, so while the first revolution was uh, more or less having a lot of tools, instruments, technologies, components that you can understand and engineer by using quantum, quantum science as a tool, as a science, as, a, as a, uh, a way to understand, a way to, to model. Uh, we are now at a stage where we can engineer quantum states. And these quantum states, or these quantum objects that we can build, uh, will rely on some bricks that we can simpli simplify into three categories of bricks. The first one is superposition. We already talked about it. It's like the Schrodinger cap. Second one is entanglement, and the third one is matter wave, which is the idea to make macroscopical or large 
quantum objects that you can manipulate and engineer. So what uh, are those uh, different tools that uh, are actually the, the, the building bricks today of uh, the second quantum revolution? So if I just to, to come back on the superposition, so I already introduced this idea that uh, quantum mechanics tells you it's probabilistic. You cannot actually decide, you cannot define the state of a system until you made a measurement. So if I go back to my photon, so I just have one photon, it's the quantized particle of electromagnetic field. The photon is a little more complex than a single particle. You can have what we uh, call some degrees of freedom. It can be in two different positions. In this case, we can say it can be in two different states that will correspond to the polarization of the light. The polarization of the light is the direction of the electromagnetic field, which could be vertical, for instance, or horizontal, if the beam was propagating in the horizontal direction. So if you change the direction of this polarization, for those who are, uh, don't know what the polarization is, if you take some sunglasses, for instance, sometimes if you turn the sunglasses, it changes the way you can see it through the screen, and that's exactly because of polarization. Uh, so you can, you can have two different states of polarization, but what quantum mechanics tells you is you can also be in a superposition uh, of these two states with, with eventually equal weight between those two states. So in this case, you will describe your system with the sum of I can be in a certain state of polarization, which is red in this case, or and I can be also in a certain state of polarization, which is blue in this case. That's square on superposition. Now, if I look at my photon, there will be a decision made. My photon can be either blue, because it, it is blue and red, but when I make the measurement, it will give a blue result, or it will be a red result. It will not give a blue and red result at the same time. So I take a photo, I make my coherent superposition, I measure blue. I take a photo, I make my coherent superposition, then I will measure red, etc., etc. And the statistic, after making many, many measurements, will actually allow me to come back to what was the coherent superposition and if I measure more red than blue, that means that my current superposition was also more red than blue. And this idea of current superposition was initially uh, uh, seen by uh, Richard Feynman as one of the biggest mysteries of quantum mechanics. And then this mystery evolved into the next step, which is entanglement. But I, I want to emphasize here that uh, entanglement is a continuity more complex uh, of this idea that you can have a system which is not defined as long as you don't measure it. It will be uh, defined as something which doesn't look natural, if you think classically, as a superposition of different states in which it can be. So if I make now the situation a little more complex, and I don't use one photon, but two photons. Uh, so each photon as before, can be in two different type of states polarized, of polarization. They can be polarized red or polarized blue, and each of the photons will be polarized red or polarized blue. Now, if I take my two photons, I create the same coherent superposition as before. I do the same measurement as before, even if I have two photons, but I do nothing. I will have an experiment which will be very similar to the, the previous one. I will see some uh, the first photon being sometimes red, sometimes blue. The second photon being sometimes red, sometimes blue. If I do the statistics, I will find that if, for example, my superposition was equally distributed, I will find have re red result as much as blue results for the first photon. The same for the second photon. But I will see no relation between them because they are completely independent. But now I can produce states by using uh, some, some, the property, some properties of, of crystals, some properties of atoms, to create a very specific state in, in which I cannot describe each photon independently. Take these states, for instance, which is 
a state where either the first photon will be red polarized and the second will be blue polarized, or the first photon will be blue polarized and the second red polarized. And I cannot have a description in which only one photon counts. And because I cannot independently say, oh, my first photon can be red and I don't care about the other one, and reciprocally. And this is entanglement. Entanglement means that, as the, as the name, the many particles that you have, in this case, the two photons, are tangled together. They are strongly correlated, that there is an event that built between them a relation that can, in which you cannot separate them, at least you cannot separate their history anymore. And this entanglement has a very strong consequence. Suppose now that you take each of these two photons and you put them very far away from each other. And very far away from each other can be very far away, like one on one side of the uh, universe and the other one of the, on the other side of the universe. But they were still, when we created them, we still created this very strong relationship between them. So there is no reason for them to forget about this relationship they had at the very beginning. So that if I now look at one photon, the one on the red, then the other photon will immediately turn blue because it has no choice. And reciprocally, if it turns blue, it will, uh, the other one will turn red. And this, again, conceptually is very uh, disturbing. I mean, it means that even after an infinite amount of time and with a distance which is infinitely long, it's, it's a little bit like if at some point the, uh, the, the photon which was not looked at, knows that the other one actually was looked at and decide which state it was. And that led to lots of stories about like the possibility to transport information very fast and the possibility, but that's also led to a very uh, big conceptual discussion and philosophical discussion between lots of scientists, including Einstein, uh, that Either quantum mechanics by itself could explain this, or there was something hidden that we did not understand and uh, that would allow us to uh, not rely on quantum mechanics to explain this uh, entanglement, this very strong relationship between the two particles, but it would be something classical. And only in the, the year, around the year 1980, this was actually experimentally demonstrated. There is a famous experiment it was done by Alain Asper in France and other people in the US, Clauser, uh, in which they did exactly the experiment I described. They took these two photons, they put them apart, and then they changed the state of one and they looked whether the other one changed at the same time. And that's a very tricky experiment. It, really, it, it required a, lots of like, development at that time, plus uh, the, the fact that you need to be very careful about what you do to be sure that uh, you are in a situation that nothing classically could actually have happened between the time you created your uh, pair of atom, uh, photons and uh, the time you make the measurement. But this uh, revolutionary experiment really triggered this uh, idea that, okay, so there is no question about the fact that quantum mechanics can lead to this very uh, strong relationship, which is called entanglement, and it's a relationship that lasts forever once you created this pair of photons with this relationship. They can still have this relationship even if they are very far away, and even if they uh, stand far away for a very long time, except if something happens that destroys this relationship. And this something happened can be the fact that there is a measurement which is done that you don't know about. And that's one of the uh, ideas behind the quantum key distribution or the quantum cryptography. You will use this, uh, this, this property and send some photons and manipulate them, uh, but you know what you're doing. And then the, uh, so Alice is sending the photons, Bob is detecting the photons, also manipulating them. And then when they compare their experiment, they can actually see whether it's still obeying the quantum rules or not. If it's obeying the quantum rules, that's perfect because that means that this pair of photons was actually not affected by the, by any uh, 
uh, external perturbation. And if there is something happening which is not normal, it means that someone has looked at your data and then the, da the data you transfer for at that moment is not secure. So it's, it's like the perfect protocol for sending encrypted information because not because you cannot decrypt the information, but because you will ex know exactly which uh, part has been decrypted. So if you're sending a key, then you know that your key is not secure and you can send a new one. And of course, the, the next consequence of this entanglement, uh, I will not explain it too much, is uh, this idea of quantum computers, which is also using this, this, uh, this uh, entanglement properties and these uh, uh, ideas that, uh, that you have qubit. Just to say, and maybe we can discuss that later, uh, there is a, uh, today lots of research about that, but basically there are many, many systems that uh, can lead to a very uh, successful quantum computer. The ones that are working today the best are uh, using what we call superconducting qubits. So they are like small circuits, very, very similar to the technology for classical computers. Uh, but in the, the quantum regime at very, very low temperature. But there are very promising uh, technologies using uh, charged particles like, like ions or neutral particles that atoms, and we'll come back on why atoms are interesting uh, in a minute. Okay, so I spoke about the two first bricks of this quantum revolution, superposition and uh, entanglement. There is a third one, which uh, I introduced to you, is, is the concept of matter waves. And this concept of matter waves is the direct consequence of this wave-particle duality that we uh, mentioned before. So I introduced this idea of wave-particle duality uh, by the fact that you could quantize the electromagnetic field, or light, and then you have a particle which is named a photon. And there is this duality between a photon and a wave. But of course, once you say that, then you can say, why not the reverse? Why, cannot, can, why an atom cannot be actually a quantized version of a wave, which in this case would be an atomic wave? And that's uh, something that was introduced by uh, uh, Louis de Breuil. He extended the concept of Einstein in, in, in about uh, 1920. And he extended it by introducing the equivalent of the wavelength that we mentioned before. Remember, the wavelength is the, the, the periodic length between uh, the oscillation of a wave. And so the idea is, if I have some matter, then there should be a, a, an equivalent wave with a periodicity, a special periodicity, which is the de Broglie wavelength. And this de Broglie wavelength is basically uh, the ratio between the Planck constant, h, and the momentum of the particle, the mass times the velocity. Which means that in order to have a large wavelength, something which actually would look like a wave, you need to be to have a very small mass and a sm very small velocity. So that's why we are not behaving like wave. I mean, if you make some... some uh, rule of thumb calculations, uh, we are about uh, like 70 kilograms or 100 kilos. Uh, we move at a meter per second, so our wavelength is like sub, 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 sub nanometers, 10 to minus 35 meters, so much smaller than what we, uh, the, the, our size. That's the same for our uh, uh, red blood cell. Uh, they are also uh, like much smaller than the, the particle itself, about 10 to minus 15 meters. But now if you take an atom, so the mass of an atom is about uh, 10 to minus 25 kilograms. They go relatively fast, but they can go like at, uh, at uh, velocities of a few meters per second, if you like uh, collect them into uh, like a, a, a vacuum chamber. And then the wavelength starts to be uh, at sizes of nanometers to micrometers, at sizes where you can actually have some mechanical objects like slits for the, the, the young slit experiment that will have the same size and you should be able to see some wave property of this particle. That's what the Broglie introduced in, to, in 1920. Uh, so 
Now, if I go back to this, uh, oops, sorry, there is sound that should be sound. Okay. So if I go back to this uh, this uh, idea of atoms, uh, now I am not using a single atom. I'm using many atoms. So it's like a gas of atoms. So when we dis when we want to describe a gas of atoms in uh, the classical version, you say, okay, I have many particles, many atoms. They are in a in a in a in a chamber or, or they are in a, in a small recipient and. Uh, and then they collide with each other. And then I have an average velocity, which corresponds to an average energy. And because I'm now using quantum mechanics to describe my system, I can describe this gas that looks like something completely random and continuous as a random distribution of energy levels, as you see on this uh, small graph, each energy level corresponding to a certain uh, velocity of the particle. Now I want to cool down my gas. So, in, uh, and this uh, was a revolutionary concept introduced thanks to, again, lots of findings of quantum mechanics. The first uh, findings of quantum mechanics we already discussed is the fact that light is actually carried by, the, the energy of the light is carried by photons. And the second concept we already discussed as well, which is the spectroscopic concept, is when a photon interacts with an atom and it has exactly the good energy then the atoms will absorb the photon. And actually what quantum mechanics tells you even more is you don't need to be exactly at the right energy. Even if you have an energy slightly smaller, you still have the probability to absorb the light. So if I send light with slightly less energy than required, eventually the atom will absorb the light. But the atom cannot hold this energy for very long. Actually, it will hold it for only a few nanoseconds and then it will go back to its previous state, the ground state. And for that, it has to release the energy. And the only way it can release the energy is by releasing a photon. But this photon will be released at exactly the energy between the state. So I grab some uh, photons with a, a certain energy, and I release some energy. But I release more energy. So at the end, the atom has to lose energy each time it does this cycle. And this cycle is very fast. Like every 10 nanoseconds, you have a cycle like that on, on average, which means that you can have many, 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 many of these cycles per second. And so even if you lose a little bit of energy each time, it results in a big, big loss of energy, which means that now the atoms will slow down, slow down, slow down, and eventually freeze the, almost at zero temperature. So this was a revolutionary finding. The fact that light can act on on matter is known, I mean, we all heard about this uh, uh, solar sails, but the fact that this uh, light, which actually can burn your skin and cool down atoms at temperatures that have been never reached before, micro-Kelvin, nano-Kelvin, so billions of degrees above the absolute zero, was a revolution that led to a Nobel Prize in 1997. So when we cool down these atoms, oops, sorry, Uh, excuse me, I have to go here. When you, when you, uh, when you, when you cool down the atoms, if you look that, at that picture, so you, at that picture in the, the quantum, with quantum mechanics, you find that you will actually put down your atoms progressively in energy levels that are smaller and smaller. If you look that classically, it means that your atoms will go slower and slower. And remember what I introduced before, the concept of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If my atom goes slower, it means that I can actually find their velocity much more precisely, which means that they have to have a position which is much less certain. So they start to become more and more fuzzy, as you see on this picture, when I cool down my sample. More and more fuzzy means my atoms are becoming more and more like a wave and less and less than a particle. And eventually, I can go to a regime where 
uh, these atoms are going so slowly that they almost freeze. And when they almost freeze, they uh, overlap with each other. So you have all these small waves that are coming all together. And then they will eventually collapse into a single gigantic wave. And that, uh, that was a, a, a second revolution in, in this laser cooling. The temperature were much lower, but now you cannot even say you have atoms anymore. What you can say is you have a giant wave, which is called a Bose-Einstein condensate. So how can we uh, do that? How can we reach those uh, temperatures? So just to give you a, like a very quick feeling about those experiments, uh, the first thing is you start with temperature, room temperature, 300 Kelvin, about uh, 25 Celsius. The double wavelength is about a picometer. The velocity of the atoms is 500 meters per second. And you want to go to nano Kelvin, where the velocity of the atoms will be centimeters per second, and the double wavelength of the order of a micron. And to do that, the first thing you do is indeed going to, uh, indeed cooling down your uh, your atoms. And you do that is in a, 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 a an atomic physics experiment such as the one shown here. So it's a a vacuum chamber, you see like the bolts and, and things, it's a tube, a metal tube in this case, in which you remove all the atoms that you don't want. So the vacuum there is very, very good. There are almost no atoms. And then you put just the atoms that you want. And then you will send some light through the holes around this vacuum chamber. The light which will actually cool down, as I said before, and collect. So you have six beams and then the intersection of all the beams, the atom will enter this freeze down and stop. And so you collect lots of atoms and you pull them down. Then you have to go at much lower temperature. And at these temperatures, you cannot really use this cooling I, I mentioned before for, for the reason that the atoms, the, the photons that you use still carry some energy. And so you have to do some other cooling, which is called evaporative cooling. So you create a, a, a box, like a cup of, 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 of atoms in this case, with some coils, the big coils that you see on the, uh, on the picture. With these coils, you will collect atoms as they, if they were small magnets. And in this, uh, in this uh, uh, cup of atoms, you will actually perform evaporative cooling, which means that you will blow away the atoms that are on the top of your cup and you will cut your cup progressively. And ultimately, at the end, you will reach a, a temperature which is low enough so that all the atoms will collapse and make a big, uh, single, gigantic matter wave. So that's uh, how we uh, today built and engineer our matter waves. And what's uh, extremely nice with that is not only you can build it, as I say here, but you can watch it. Uh, you can take picture of this matter wave. So it, it does not become a concept anymore. It does not become something that you measure from, from uh, like digits. You take a CCD camera you, and you will take a picture of uh, the atoms that you cool down. And then you see this very black spot uh, that you can see on the, on the right side of the, of, the, of the slide. And this uh, very black spot is basically a gigantic matter wave. And you can measure this gigantic matter wave, uh, uh, and you can look at the behavior of this gigantic matter wave. And for instance, you can uh, not only look at where it is, but if you wait long enough, then the, this matter wave is moving, and you can measure its uh, momentum, its velocity, as you see here. And you can perform experiments with that. So I will very briefly describe one experiment. And uh, this experiment is uh, uh, using the fact that you can manipulate and control this matter wave very precisely. So I created my cloud of uh, uh, matter wave, and then I'm letting it move. It moves at a velocity, which is V, and I measure it on my screen like that. And then I will make an experiment, which is like a, a, a matter wave pinball. So I put some random uh, spots that will actually prevent my uh, wave to move straight and it has to bounce back and forth and because it has to bounce it actually changes its velocity it, we say it randomizes the velocity and it fills up a ring around which is telling us okay now the matter wave actually is moving a little bit everywhere and you do the experiment and you wait and 
because you have more and more uh, bounces, you fill up the ring more and more. It means that you randomize basically this very precise velocity that you defined at the beginning. But if you wait long enough on that experiment with the matter wave, at some point you see something which doesn't look like a uniform ring. You see a bump exactly at the reverse. So it's like if you were playing pinball, uh, pinball and that without having to press the side buttons, your ball would go up without needing anything. So in this case, you have the, 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 the wave which is supposed to go forward, but then a large part of the wave will go backward. And this uh, is not supposed to happen if you add a classical description of your particle. And here yeah, it happens because you have interferences. So you, if you take the sum of all these uh, trajectories, there is a possible, a possible uh, trajectory which actually leads you back to where you were initiate, uh, initiated. And because the path of different uh, trajectories will be exactly equal, you will have a constructive interference, like for the, 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 the young slit experiment. And this constructive interference actually leads to uh, some waves which is going backward with a very strong probability. And that sounds like a textbook experiment, but it's actually very important because what we've done here is a quantum simulation of the conduction of electrons in random lattices, something that was predicted by uh, Anderson, and it's called Anderson localization, uh, about uh, 60 years ago. So what we have done here is we have replaced basically electrons by our matter wave. We have replaced our crystal by these small dots that we put everywhere. And we have constructed a solid that has the property of a, a superconductor or of a classical semiconductor. And this is basically uh, the idea behind quantum simulations. You use this quantum object that we control very well. We put them in situations that resemble what you have before. And then you can study this phenomena. I cannot enter into the detail, but then you can make lots of measurements and by just watching them and taking pictures of basically what's happening, something you cannot do in a semiconductor. And this interference has a, another consequence, and this is the last uh, application I will uh, describe about this uh, quantum technologies and, and quantum mechanics. So interference comes from the fact that a quantum system evolving from one initial state to the final state, if you have many possibilities to travel from one state to the other, this is concept introduced by Feynman, you will, in order to know what is the outcome of your uh, experiment or the outcome of the evolution, you need to sum the amplitude of all the paths, and this is why you can have interference. But you, instead of like uh, having this interference randomly happening, like in the case of the quantum simulator, you can actually engineer it. So you can say, now I will send my wave, I will split it, and I will redirect it, and I will uh, recombine it. In that case, you are building an interferometer. And this is something that has been also done experimentally now for, for 20, 25 years, and this first concept back to the 70s with neutron, where you're doing matter wave interferences, and these matter wave interferences, they look like an interferometer in optics, except that here the light is doing all the manipulation and the wave is a matter wave. Because the wave is a matter wave, if you have an acceleration, for instance, your interferometer is bended, and then the readout of this interferometer will be proportional, in this case, to gravity, if you are measuring acceleration along the vertical direction. And not only it will measure, it will be sensitive to gravity, but it will be very sensitive to gravity. This is actually uh, one of the best ways to measure acceleration. And you can measure gravity at levels which are few nanometers per second square. So this is like much, much smaller than the variation of gravity, which is, for instance, in you see the tides uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the ocean. And this variation, uh, they are, and they allow you, for instance, to, measure, to look at the, the variation on the ground and eventually detect water cavities uh, because they are very sensitive. They are exact or accurate, and you can measure it for a very long time. And this has many applications from uh, oil and gas, from uh, uh, surveying water on the ground, 
earth monitoring, where you can watch earthquake with that. And you can actually detect earthquake in China, even if you are in the US or in Europe. Uh, and you can also do many more things like navigation and etc. And uh, this was one of the questions. This is one of the uh, uh, object which is based on quantum technology that is available commercially today. Okay, so just to finish, there are many applications that come from that. Not only, uh, like if I speak about sensors here, I can do some uh, underground survey, I can do some navigation, I can do some fundamental physics. And if I look at quantum science in general, basically there is a tree with branches, and maybe I'm missing some branches, that go from uh, medicine, navigation, the big data, chemistry, uh, fundamental physics that is posing like uh, raising questions beyond general relativity, the LED, the transistor, the camera. So there is a, a large range of applications, and I hope I couldn't show everything, but I hope that I gave you uh, some some uh, some good feeling about uh, how rich this uh, fit can be, and it's so rich that this is one of the reasons why we started this uh, journal, a uh, AVS Quantum Science. Uh, just to try to have a journal dedicated to quantum science, trying to cover everything that you can think of, all the topics, and trying to cover it in a way that if someone wants actually to look at quantum science, it will come to this journal and will see all the potential applications. Quantum science is very uh, multidisciplinary, and basically, uh, as scientists, we are very often going to other uh, fields, other branches, uh, when we are trying to do quantum science. And this is one of the, the motivation and why uh, we have basically all this topic going from material, from computers, from biology, from photonics, uh, to sensing and engineering and etc. So I uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Uh, so I uh, have a list of Questions. So I don't know. I think I should just uh, like pick up some few questions. Uh, Heather, is it uh, how I should proceed? I guess. Um, so I tried to pick up a few questions. I hope I uh, already was able to answer some of them. Uh, so there were some some very uh, interesting questions. So uh, like, uh, for instance. Uh, there was something about, a question was asked about, is anything new about uh, uh, Tonomura's lab study on, on charged particles? Um, so I don't know uh, why well, he's done lots of things. And for instance, the, uh, uh, the uh, young slit experiment that I showed at the beginning were among one of them. Uh, there is a lot about charged particles that I did not mention. And, there is, of course, electrons, and there is, of course, ions. Uh, ions are sh charged atoms. Uh, you can manipulate them in a very similar way that I uh, presented for, for, for atoms. And today, it is one of the uh, uh, big candidates for uh, a future quantum computer, because you can easily, really isolate easily one ion, and you can actually make chain of ions, you can connect them together, and this gives you the access to the scalability that you need for a quantum computer. Uh, there, there was, uh, so there was a question about entanglement, and I hope the presentation I gave at least helped you a little bit to understand that. Uh, so, there was a, an interesting question which relates to the last part of my talk about a uh, few specific physical systems that we should try to simulate with a quantum computer in the next couple of years. Uh, so basically, uh, if I go beyond the question, I would say uh, often today when you speak about quantum computer, we have different classes of computers. There is, of course, the uh, universal computer, the one which would have uh, a quantum processor in which you can program and which can solve problems such as, uh, uh, for example, the, 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 the factorization of numbers and etc. Or maybe some, uh, some uh, a better way of, of sorting uh, data and etc. 
But now if I go to simulation of, of, of systems, uh, I can also go to the quantum simulator. We can build dedicated computers that we could call analog computers uh, that will answer a simple question, a little bit like I showed before. Here it's, can we actually build a system that will look at uh, the behavior of uh, uh, electrons in a solid with respect to disorder? Uh, or can we simulate a neutron star? And so there are plenty of those things that we can do. Uh, so now it's maybe it's not as important as would be, for example, to have a, 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 a quantum computer for, for advanced quantum chemistry. Uh, but there are things we can do today, and we can uh, like that can lead us to understand much better some processes. And one of the big, for instance, uh, motivation is trying to push this quantum simulator in order to understand the process behind high TC superconductivity. Uh, so another question, which I'm not sure I, well, we can always, so where will be quantum mechanics in the next 10 years? Uh, well, I think we, we pretty much see what's going to happen in the next 10 years. There will be a, a, lot, of it, a lot of research uh, dedicated to technological advance. And, and something maybe I did not uh, emphasize in my talk is the fact that uh, uh, all this uh, revolution that uh, happened uh, in the process of the evolution of quantum science happened not only because the concept evolved, it also happened because we were able to do experiments. And we were only able to do those experiments because the technology was pushed. Uh, doing laser cooling without the laser would have been impossible. So without the revolution of the laser in the 50s, we could not do what we do today with ions and with atoms, and we could not do this quantum simulator. Um, and, and I think that's what's happening today. It's, there is a, lot, a very strong push on the technology, which will help us to actually control much better all these quantum systems or this quantum technology. Uh, and it's hard to see what's going to be in the in the future, but sure, there will still be a lot to learn about quantum simulation and quantum computing. And there is something else: is we might reach uh, situations where we can start to go beyond uh, our findings or our ideas about quantum mechanics, and that relates to a, a, another question uh, that was. Uh, uh, raised about the definition of time. Are you sure that it is actually time which people call as time? And uh, so I, I like this question because it's also uh, strongly related to some, some, some research I'm, I'm, I'm doing, but it's also strongly related to the fact that today uh, we are able to engineer quantum systems that uh, start to be very big, like some entangled states between the Earth and the satellite. Uh, some matter waves that propagate over like tens of uh, hundreds of meters. And so that's uh, not the science of the small anymore. And uh, before, in the vision of quantum mechanics, that time was absolutely well defined. I mean, you have equations in which time is extremely well de uh, defined for the evolution of the quantum system. General relativity, for instance, tells you that time can flow differently at different places. Uh, time is not well defined. And today, uh, we have some uh, quantum system that starts to be in a regime where maybe we should actually revisit this concept of time with respect to quantum, to general relativity. And that's actually uh, another very exciting uh, branch of, of quantum science that's emerging today because we can do this very large scale experiment or we, because we can take like nano objects, nanoparticles, but they are very big compared to an atom, and now manipulate them and so that they behave like quantum. Uh, I'm trying to see. Uh, so maybe some some more specific question about the journal. Uh, uh, so uh, we try to cover in this journal uh, all the topics. There is no uh, restriction as long as it's addressing quantum, and on the contrary, I would say uh, I, I would be in favor of having as much as we can just to have with this journal a place where all the people who are actually interested to pushing quantum science 
the next scale uh, want to come and want to have some insights and some ideas about uh, how this uh, feed can be. Uh, and of course, you need to focus. So we uh, we have some specific topics that uh, uh, we write down, just uh, topics that we uh, identified, and we also have some some specific collections in which we emphasize some hot topic of the moment, uh, like today quantum photonics or quantum computing or uh, quantum sensing and metrology. Uh, I saw uh, Yeah, so the, the, there were lots of questions about quantum computers, uh, which I'm not sure I can understand for all of them. So there were questions about uh, what what will be the the, the best platform uh, to realize quantum information processing on quantum computing. So as I uh, showed in my uh, talk, there are many candidates today uh, going from uh, superconducting qubits to ions to atoms, maybe to NG centers uh, uh, and photons. For most of the uh, quantum computers that you can actually have access to today uh, from companies like IBM or Z-Wave, uh, they are using this um, superconducting qubits because this is a technology which is extremely well controlled and has a level of scalability which is today accessible. There are also very good candidates such as ions or atoms. Uh, maybe one advantage of the ions and the atoms is that they are potentially better as a quantum system, more isolated. And, and in, that, in this case, uh, often, uh, often you want to define uh, a qubit with its fidelity, with the, uh, the, the quality of the qubit by its fidelity, and if you don't have like 99% of fidelity, you need to have quantum correction uh, algorithm or quantum correction codes in order to guarantee that you still are uh, making a quantum operation. Uh, so this requires lots of resources for the superconducting qubits, and maybe the next system will uh, be better for that. But it's hard to say which will be the best because Maybe the atom is better than the qubit with respect to the physics, but maybe the uh, superconducting qubit in terms of scalability, ability to make a, uh, like a product will be much better. And this, uh, I think, are the questions that are raised today and that uh, is the focus of, of many groups and companies uh, for this big activity around the quantum computer. Uh, I don't know how much uh, time I still have. Uh, it's almost late. Be, yes. Hi, this is Heather. Um, I think we can go ahead and wrap it up if you're feeling good about the Q&A. Uh, I'm okay. If uh, well, there are still lots of people connected, so I guess uh, yeah. Uh, we're about ten minutes over, so I think okay. we'll get yeah. to a close. Okay. And we'd thank really you. like to thank you for doing your presentation on quantum science opportunities and challenges. We I hope everybody enjoyed the. Uh, e-talk and we look forward to our next one and thank you all very much for participating and again thank you to Philippe for joining us on this e-talk. Well thank you I, I hope you enjoyed the, the, this hour about quantum science thank you very much. Thank you very much goodbye. <laughs>